So here's the scenario. If you're a diver like me, you love to be underwater. You love to dive. It's been a few weeks since I've been underwater. You get out one morning, the weather's beautiful outside. You know that the local dive site dive conditions have to be just beautiful too. So you pick up the phone, call your buddy. Hey, let's go get a dive in today. No, nope, no one's interested in diving. I mean, you've been to this local dive site a hundred times before. You know it like the back of your hand. So have you ever had the thought about just strapping on that tank, putting your gear on and going for a dive all by yourself? Hmm. Today, we're gonna to talk about the dangers and the misconceptions of solo diving. Welcome to Everything Scuba. Hi guys, welcome to Everything Scuba. I'm Lyle. We are here today to talk about kind of a controversial topic in the world of scuba diving. We are going to talk about solo diving. So, since the onset of recreational diving, and we should make clear that I'm talking specifically about recreational divers here. I'm a recreational dive instructor. Uh, the buddy system has been in place, and uh, we teach that to our students from day one, that your buddy is there as an emergency backup should anything go wrong underwater. Whether we like it or not, scuba diving has some inherent risks, and we have to be willing to accept those risks but try to mitigate them through dive planning, uh, safety concepts, and the training that is given to and should continue throughout the lifetime of you as a diver. And so we want to talk a little bit about the difference between diving alone versus solo diving. And we'll talk about the dangers of being by yourself underwater and some of the misconceptions that people might have about solo diving. Uh, this is going to be part of a series that will uh, bring you to hopefully educate you about solo diving and do it as safely as you possibly can and open your world a little bit more. It certainly did for me when I became a solo diver. Uh, I can do some things now that I wasn't able to do previously. <laughs> let's talk about diving alone versus being a solo diver. To me, someone who dives alone is either potentially someone who got separated from their group and is now either in search for their buddy or trying to make their way to the surface. There are some divers, and I know some personally, who will dive alone. And the difference between diving alone versus a solo diver, a solo diver is still someone who is underwater by themselves. However, they have built-in redundancies and built-in training to hopefully make their dive as safe as possible. And again, throughout this series, we're gonna address each area of solo diving uh, in terms of the gear that is required, in terms of the theoretical knowledge that you should have to plan your dive and execute it safely. And then lastly, what are some of the skills involved in the certification process? So the difference between solo diver and diving alone, a solo diver, much like when you get in uh, a jet airplane, a commercial airliner, uh, you can be assured that there are redundant backup systems to allow that plane to stay in the air. As a solo diver, we have built in redundant systems to keep us alive if something were to go wrong and we had to abort our dive and come back to the surface safely. Uh, when you took your advanced open water class, or if you haven't taken it yet, one of the things that you're going to learn is that we always have a primary objective and a secondary objective when we're diving. The primary objective is to return safely from every dive. The secondary objective is whatever else you want to do during that dive we can't lose sight of our own safety. And so as a someone who dives alone, you are literally taking the chance without any redundant systems that nothing's going to go wrong. And that's a chance that I personally am not willing to take. So let's get into talking about some of the dangers of 
being a solo diver or diving alone, especially now that we know the difference between those two. Uh, the first one that comes to everybody's mind, what if I lost my ability to breathe from my tank? Either a catastrophic air loss event, uh, potentially an O-ring blows and all of a sudden we're losing air at a very rapid rate. We have a regulator that starts to free flow on us. Yes, you can switch to your alternate, but this is going to continue to free flow. When you did your open water training, uh, we make you breathe out of a free flowing regulator to prove that you can actually breathe out of that regulator underwater. But in a period of about 30 seconds, you can drop somewhere between six and 700 PSI from your tank. And so depending on when that happens during the dive, that can be a, a major problem for you. And so that's one of the first things to think about is gas management. Uh, within the solo diving world, we are always going to have a redundant way to switch to an alternate tank. That means we have to take extra gas with us on the dive and be able to switch to that quickly and safely from our primary system. Another area for us to consider would be navigation uh, and loss of direction. So uh, do you have the ability to comfortably and reliably use a compass underwater to get you from point A to point B or back to the shore, back to the boat, back to safety? Uh, once you enter that environment, you're by yourself. You're relying on yourself to do that. Uh, if you know the dive site well enough, might be able to use uh, natural navigational resources. Uh, you know where this coral head or that sponge is, uh, and that helps get you around. If it's the first time being there, maybe uh, checking into someone to give you a uh, underwater tour uh, and, and doing some local uh, diving. Uh, with someone who knows the area certainly would be useful, but we're going to concentrate also on your navigational skills and we'll talk more about that. Being able to read the conditions of the dive site and whether it's safe for you to dive period or dive alone on that date is an essential uh, skill to have. So here in the Midwest, maybe not quite as critical because a lot of us dive in quarries and lakes. We don't have to deal with too much in the way of currents and waves. Although here, you know, it's, it's getting colder. Things are starting to ice over. Uh, I'm not an ice diver, not a trained ice diver. So that's a condition that I'm not going to put myself in. Uh, in the Caribbean, where I do a lot of my training, uh, that site on certain days, we can have uh, three to five foot breakers coming ashore. So trying to just get in and out uh, of that shore dive uh, can be uh, difficult at best. And also there, there's a pretty strong longshore current. Sometimes it'll reverse current. Sometimes there's a rip current that'll want to pull you out. So do you have the ability to read those conditions and make that judgment call before you put yourself at danger and also you have to remember, you're not just putting yourself in danger. If you get pulled out and get lost at sea, someone's gotta to have to maybe hopefully come get you and you're putting them in danger too. So given that list of dangers that I just put out there, some people out there, out there might be thinking, why in the heck would you ever wanna solo dive by yourself? Well, a few reasons. As an instructor, even if I'm in the water with a group of four uh, brand new open water students, I'm kind of theoretically solo diving. Uh, if I had an issue underwater, um, I can't really rely on someone who's just learning how to dive to save me. So I need to have some inherent knowledge, self-rescue abilities to, to save myself. So that one might be first uh, on the list. Second might be if you're a safety diver. Many times they're put in the water by themselves. Safety divers are um, a little bit of a different category though. They generally work as a team. So they either have someone at the surface or on shore and they have a communication system. They can chat back and forth. They uh, kind of let them know how they're doing and what they're doing. But they also have to have inherent skills that if uh, things go awry or have a mishap that they have some redundancies uh, built in that will help save them as a safety diver. Uh, stress reduction. Um, I know that when I solo dive in the right environment, I'm not worrying about other people during the dive. I can purely be there by myself 
and enjoy that environment by myself. Uh, another aspect of why you would dive by yourself, I love underwater photography, I love underwater videography, and so if you're trying to capture certain things uh, that don't want to have uh, 10 other divers around, then being by yourself and having that ability, and you're going to see in one of our upcoming videos uh, where I walk you through a solo dive that I got to sit and watch uh, a particular organism for about a 45 minute period. Uh, other divers that were with me that would be bored out of their mind because I'm st just staying in one place the entire time. Uh, but it allows me that ability to have the freedom to choose how long I stay at a particular area and what I do when I'm doing that. So what are some of the misconceptions that people might have about solo diving? Uh, number one thing that I've heard is that it's just reckless that no one should ever do it. Uh, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. However, uh, that's an opinion that I feel is a little too strong. Um, I am a very conservative diver. Um, uh, we talked a, a little bit ago about always adhering to the primary objective of a dive, which is to return safely from every dive. That is always topmost in my mind. And so uh, I think that uh, with the appropriate foresight, the appropriate knowledge, the appropriate gear, and the appropriate approach to solo diving, it can be done within the realms of safety that's acceptable. Again, there are inherent risks to scuba diving. Uh, if you're a diver, you're already accepting a certain level of risk. When you become a solo diver, uh, that's an extra added layer of risk that some people are willing to accept and some people simply aren't and there's nothing wrong with that you always want to be there with a buddy have a backup have at it um, we're never going to discourage anyone from uh, enjoying the sport that we all love uh, based on that another misconception amongst divers might be the fact that you just heard me say that I am a conservative diver and you might feel the same way so what is wrong with you strapping on your aluminum 80 dropping down to 20 to 30 feet, being there for an hour all by yourself, you know, the dive site, no issues. Or you might say, hey, I've got a stage bottle or a pony bottle, and uh, I'm just going to strap that on and take it with me. Anybody can solo dive. So that's kind of the other uh, end of the spectrum where not everybody should solo dive. Um, we require, prior to starting your Patty Self-Reliant course, 100 dives to be logged and under your belt already and we won't train anyone who is not a rescue diver also uh, during that rescue class you hopefully come out with good strong uh, rescue skills in terms of self-rescue and the ability to recognize certain uh, things that uh, you can see and do prior to an event occurring uh, so experience then additional training uh, in terms of dive planning, gas management, navigational uh, awareness, and the gear that we need to take to have the appropriate redundant systems that will keep us alive. Remember that jet plane needs to have redundant systems if something goes wrong so it stays in the air. We need redundant systems as a solo diver so that if something goes wrong, we can come back to the surface and always fulfill our primary objective to return safely from every dive. As I stated earlier guys, becoming a solo diver and a solo dive instructor has opened up a whole new world for me within the sport that I love. Uh, it's a controversial area. There's strong opinions on, on both sides of the argument here. You got your own strong opinion? We'd love to hear them in the comments below. Let's have a discussion about it. If we piqued your interest, do you wanna know more about okay, what's involved? We're going to talk about the essential gear that you're going to need to be a safe and trained solo diver. Today we're going to talk about the must-have gear that you need to be a safe solo diver. Must-have here is underlined. 
It doesn't mean it would be nice to have, it would be cool to have. It means this is essential gear that you need to carry with you on every dive to make sure that you are a safe solo diver. And so we're gonna walk you through, step by step, the different redundant systems that we ask you to carry during a solo dive. First off, we are going to talk a little bit about the Paddy Self-Reliant class. If you're a diver that's interested in pursuing a solo diving certification, Paddy offers the Self-Reliant Certification class. That is a class where you work in close association with an experienced instructor who will walk you step by step through that process. Uh, that includes the theory and knowledge review for dive planning, gas management, uh, in order to safely execute a dive by yourself. It includes the gear and the gear setup. How do we wear that underwater and uh, be safe with that? And then lastly, performing this necessary skills with that instructor. It includes classroom session. It also includes three separate dives. The third dive, typically, you will dive solo. You'll still perform skills. That's something to work with your uh, instructor on exactly what they would have you do in that situation. But there are specific requirements that we have for that class. Let me walk you through them. Number one, you need to be at least 18 years of age. Number two, you need to have at least 100 log dives that you can show to your instructor when you show up for the class that day. Number three, you need to be at least an advanced open water diver or have a qualification from another certifying agency that is equivalent to that. And lastly, just like I said, you have to fulfill the requirements within the class. This is something that I, as an instructor, take very seriously. Uh, we're not just gonna hand out a card to you if we feel that you don't meet the standards uh, that we require. On top of the PADI requirements to begin that class, there are other certifications that I personally believe would be very beneficial to have under your belt before you start a solo diving class. The first of which would be underwater navigation. Uh, that is a certification that will teach you not only to appropriately use uh, a compass and confidently uh, navigate underwater, it teaches you how to use natural navigation resources underwater. Uh, and so during the solo dive, you're going to be put through your paces in terms of underwater navigation and proving to that instructor that you can get from point A to point B and back again and exit the water safely. So underwater navigation, look into it. The second and the third certification that I would look at prior to taking on a solo diving class would be nitrox or enriched air. I, as a solo diver, would routinely use nitrox. It gives me more bottom time, but it gives me a little bit more insight into partial pressure calculations and dive planning. Deep diving, you performed a single deep dive during your advanced open water class, and that gives you some information in terms of uh, diving that deeply. However, finishing that certification will definitely give you more insight into dive uh, planning and also gas management both of which we will go into a lot more detail on as a solo diver, really critical uh, information. We have performed a variety of deep dives on this uh, channel previously. Click that link up above and go check those out. The final certification that I would strongly, strongly encourage anyone pursuing a solo diving certification is to look at Rescue Diver. Probably one of the most physically and mentally challenging classes that you will take as a diver, but provides so much information in terms of self-rescue, situational awareness, being aware of your surroundings, and uh, being able to plan for potential accidents that may occur. Back to must-have read essential gear to become a solo diver. First up, we're gonna take a look at redundant gas systems. There's a variety of ways that we can take redundant gas under the water with us, and we're gonna go visit 
uh, my good friend, Mark Lindsay, course director, owner of Sweet Bottom Dive Center down on St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And Mark is going to walk us through each potential option that we can use as divers underwater for redundant gas. Thank you, Lyle. And so we have several options here. The first option is back mount doubles. And if you're going to use back mount doubles, you need to make sure you have an isolator valve and a manifold. Uh, because if you do have a problem with one tank, you want to be able to isolate that tank and then go ahead and uh, just supply gas from the second tank. Second option over here, Lyle, is a uh, standard aluminum 80 set up in side mount. And so what you see here is you see that it has a stage kit on it already. Uh, the only thing I would probably add to this cylinder here is I would add a couple of retention bands just to help keep my hoses nice and neat and streamlined. Another option you can use here, this is an aluminum 40 cubic foot stage bottle. And so this is very popular with technical divers. This is typically where they'll have their 50% uh, oxygen mix or their 100% oxygen mix. But you could certainly use a uh, setup like this for your self-reliant diving also. You have a stage kit, have a couple of retention bands, and uh, all you would need is a stage regulator then. The two options we're going to use for this class is this is an aluminum 30 cubic foot tank. It's set up here with a stage kit, and you can see it's got a couple of retention bands already. Um, this particular one has a uh, pro valve on it, and so what we're going to do to prepare this is we're going to take the DIN insert out of the pro valve. And then what we can do is we can utilize one of our stage regulators, and a lot of companies sell stage regulators. This happens to be from DiveRite. Um, we love dive right. We do a lot of business with dive right. And it comes with a first stage and a standard 40 inch MyFlex hose and a second stage. And then you'll also notice it has a short six inch high pressure hose uh, for the submersible pressure gauge. And so when we go ahead uh, to prepare this, all we're going to do is just <clears throat> screw the regulator in. So you guys, uh, previously we uh, reviewed the different types of uh, cylinder valves and uh, we start with yoke primarily in the U.S., but uh, this is a different type of uh, valve. This is the DIN valve that Mark's using today. And the why, reason, why, why, did, why did they use DIN versus yoke, Mark? Yeah, so that's a real good question, Lyle. And the reason that we like to use DIN on things like this is, first of all, it's not as cumbersome. It's not sticking out this far. Uh, and it gives you a much more streamlined um, appearance to it, and so it's not catching on things. Now what I'm going to do with this uh, hose here is I'm going to just tuck the hose underneath retention bands. And what we're going to do is create a nice neat little package here. Then what we can do is we can pull the mouthpiece right in so it's being held like that. Now in this particular one, I also have a little clip. Oh, clip's on the other one. So I'll just transfer that clip. That's not a problem. And Dive Right makes this little elastic band here too. So this is really nice. And they're really just a couple of dollars for this elastic band. But the whole idea, what it does, is it provides a breakaway uh, attachment for a clip. And so all I'm going to do here is just I'll feed it through here first. Just the swivel on the snap bolt. And then just bring it right through. And there we have our clip. 
Nice. That's pretty 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 fast compared to tying it in with uh, some line. Absolutely. And you know what? We really don't like to tie these in with line either because if you're going to be doing side mount diving or if you're going to be doing technical diving, you want these to be able to break away. And so one of the tricks that we've done in the past before we had this nice elastic band is we would go ahead and we would use just an O-ring and fold it in half and tie the O-ring on. And then that way, if we needed to break, uh, break away that snap bolt, it was no big deal, just a quick yank and you could break that O-ring. Okay, so this is our 30 cubic foot cylinder all set up and you can see it's ready to be staged now. So we can go ahead and carry that in side mount fashion on our BCD harness. Okay, this is kind of a unique setup though today, Lyle, and this is a uh, 19 cubic foot aluminum cylinder. And with this particular cylinder, we have a very unique um, holder for it. And this is set up so that you can go ahead and attach that to your main cylinder on your BCD. Now this is made by Highland uh, and sold by XS Scuba, but there are several companies that make a, a similar type of cylinder holder. Um, this would be commonly used with um, like the public safety divers. And so you'll see that a lot with public safety divers where they'll have their aluminum 80 and then they'll have this attached to the side of the aluminum 80. All right, so it's, it's back mounted as opposed to uh, slung on the side like uh, most state, state follows would be. Correct, and okay. you can see again, it's a pro valve. So we can take the DIN insert out and then we can use a DIN type stage regulator on it. Perfect. So again, it keeps it nice and streamlined. One of the other options that I might consider with something like this is I may forego the six inch uh, high pressure hose here and I might just put a button gauge right on this first stage. Because in this particular configuration, you're not gonna be able to look back and look at that air pressure anyway. Once this is on, this is on. Okay. And so strictly redundant air source, you're not using it as part of your dive plan. This is your backup to your backup to your backup. If you have an emergency, it's your fail safe. Well, perfect. So, guys, that's a that's a nice overview of the uh, options available to divers for redundant gas uh, during a dive. Uh, later today, uh, Jeff with Triton Drum and I are going to be uh, once again under the tutelage of, of Mark, and uh, we're going to gear up and we're going to show you what we look like geared up, and we're going to talk a little bit about all the redundant systems that we're going to use. So, excellent. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome, Lyle. Yeah. Hey, thanks to Mark for that awesome review of the various ways that we can take redundant gas with us on a solo dive. Just a quick heads up though, guys, if you wanted to use back doubles or side mount doubles, uh, you need to be certified in those particular systems to be able to use them in this class. Things like a stage tank, the pony bottle, uh, that's all part of the education of the Patty Self-Reliant class, so uh, you don't have to be specifically certified in those. So the number one piece of must-have gear that you need to have is a redundant breathable gas system. In this uh, class, we're going to use air. It could be nitrox, but you need to have breathable gas as a secondary redundant system. That's not the only must-have or essential piece of equipment and gear that you need to have. So next up, and let's check out all the other things that we need to take with us to be a solo diver. On this episode, we're gonna talk about the essential gear, the essential items in addition to the redundant gas that you need to take with you on a dive, have on your person to be a safe solo diver. So let's join me this time in the Sweet Bottom uh, classroom on St. Croix. I'm going to walk you through each piece of equipment that's required for the class if you want to take the Patty Self Reliant class. And certainly we recommend you take these on every solo dive. Other things we've got to think about as self reliant divers, as the name would suggest, being self reliant means that we don't have anybody else there to bail us out of trouble. And so we need to be cognizant about additional equipment that we will need potentially on a dive. And so I'm just going to walk you through some of the redundancies that we will use 
as a self-reliant diver. Already we talked about air, probably the most important one. We're going to carry an extra uh, separate bottle with its own isolated regulator that if we ran into trouble, we could switch to and ascend safely. Obviously the primary objective of every dive is to come back for that dive in one piece. And so uh, that's number one. Number two, we gotta think about masks. So I have my main mask here that I would wear, and if I were to have a problem with the strap or the mask leaked or tore uh, and suddenly flooded, um, this is a prescription mask, so uh, if I took this off under water, I can't see very far at all. I'd be in, I'd be in big trouble. So much like uh, full face mask diving, uh, we're gonna carry an additional separate redundant mask which will be clipped off to our BCD. If we have an issue, we could easily switch to this mask and complete the dive. And one point is that if at any point in time we need to use a redundancy, that dive's over. We're not taking any chances. We want to be as conservative as possible uh, when it comes to diving by ourselves. Other redundant items. We're going to carry two cutting tools. So I have my line cutter and then I have a little mini fog cutter here which acts as shears or as a dive knife and those will be clipped off to me too. I should be able to reach either one of these with one hand. If I were in an entanglement situation, I should always be able to retrieve both or one of your cutters with a single hand. So we're going to carry those. In terms of navigation, well, I wear a Shearwater Perdix AI and I also carry with me an analog compass. So I have a digital uh, uh, compass in my Shearwater and an analog compass. So if one fails, I've got another to help back me up. S surface signaling devices, well, we'll carry with us our SMB and a uh, 100 foot reel. So if we needed to shoot this to the surface to signal to someone that we're down below, uh, we have that. And then also at the surface, we would have some type of sound making device. And so usually I've got my storm whistle here. Obviously, if you guys follow everything scuba, you saw that we did a whole series on surface signaling devices, uh, looking at the necessary items that we would expect you to carry with you on a dive, looked at the different types of uh, DSMBs. And the last thing that I would always carry as a self-reliant diver, and it's already attached to my BCD, I don't have it in here with me, is a marine rescue GPS. So in the worst case scenario, I was able to surface a long way from shore from the boat. I can pop open my GPS unit, activate it, and it's going to uh, distribute my GPS location within 34 miles to marine vessels on the marine emergency channels. And uh, that's insurance that I would purchase every day. Uh, so I'm going to drop links above to all of our previous surface signaling um, uh, programs that we have. Last thing, or also um, in relation to my dive computer, because this is air integrated, uh, I can see my tank pressure on here, my main tank pressure. I also carry with me a separate SPG, so if this were to fail or my transmitter failed, I would have a separate SPG on my main tank so I can tell what that pressure is reading. So my computer serves you know, multiple purposes uh, in terms of compass and uh, air pressure. Uh, lastly, another way to surface signal, I always carry a small dive light. This happens to be the, the Sea Life uh, uh, mini dive light. It's the uh, 900 lumen one. Uh, plenty bright if you're at night. Uh, but the nice thing about this uh, light is not only does it function just as a regular light, but it has a strobe function. So if I'm at the surface and I'm at night floating by myself, I can do a strobe. I can also turn it on to an SOS signal. If I've got passing vessels, I can indicate to them where I'm at and signal my SOS. So a really nice little dive light and that's clipped off to me as well. So, and then lastly, I always carry a slate. Uh, this is a nice multiple slate. It's very compact, fits on my forearm. Uh, I can keep track of uh, maybe what I've seen during the dive. Also, I use it for natural navigational purposes. So if I'm identifying certain landmarks that I'm passing over, 
I'll note those down. That way, I've got a mental note on my return passage uh, that I'm headed back in the right direction. So, quick review of the redundancies that we're going to uh, need on a self reliant dive. Well, it seems like we got to take a lot of stuff with us as a solo diver, right? But we did cover a lot of ground there. So, over the past two episodes, we've talked about the Patty Self Reliant class. What are the requirements that you need to have in place before you can even start that class? We talked about the additional certifications that we strongly recommend that you pursue. We just feel like those are going to make you a, a much safer and just an exceptional solo diver if you have those on top. Uh, we talked about redundant gas systems, different ways that we can carry that redundant gas with us, and also covering all the essential items that we need to carry with us in addition today. So next up, we're gonna go to the classroom. I know, I know, it's not as sexy as the gear and the uh, uh, diving portion of this, but there's some essential theoretical uh, concepts that we need to have, some calculations that you need to do to dive plan accurately. So we're gonna cover things like surface air consumption rates. How do we calculate that on a personal basis? Uh, reserve pressures, what size tanks are we gonna use and how do we go about planning that dive? Today, we're gonna to talk about the most important piece of equipment that any diver has and that's right here. You need to understand the concepts of dive planning, how to calculate your surface air consumption rate so you can appropriately plan for the amount of gas that you're gonna require, and how do we do this safely? How do we plan a dive and execute it? How do we stick to that plan? So, first off, let's talk a little bit about the self-reliant diver mentality. As a self-reliant diver or solo diver, you are not going to have a buddy under the water to help you out if things go awry. As such, self-reliant divers have a little bit of a different mentality when it comes to dive planning and preparedness for diving. We are going to maintain our equipment. We are going to make sure it's serviced, up to date, and everything is functional. We are going to know all about the conditions associated with the dive site that we're going to dive at that day, the weather, current, surf, all the things that we need to know. We're also going to anticipate potential problems with that dive site. What could occur under the water and how do we prepare ourselves for that? And importantly, if we occur problems during the dive, we are not going to ignore particularly small problems. An accident of almost any size usually is a cumulative effect of small problems along the way that were ignored, missed, or not taken care of. And so we really want to prepare ourselves in a way to make sure that the best way to not get in an accident is to prepare yourself ahead of time to avoid that accident. First, let's talk about dive planning and formulating that dive plan. Things that we must fill our brain with prior to the dive. So let's think of dive planning in terms of four phases. The first, advanced planning for the dive. What is our objective? What do we want to accomplish while we're there? The dive site is going to probably hold that objective for us. And what are the logistics involved in getting ourselves to that site. Phase two of dive planning is preparation, making sure our gear is prepared, maintained, in good shape. Do we have tank fills? Is our redundant tank filled and ready to go? And looking ahead at potential conditions. So weather reports, uh, you can use uh, marine uh, surf and tidal reports if you're diving in the ocean, and also potentially contacting the local dive shop who knows all about the conditions if they're diving there every day. Phase three, last minute prep, day of the dive. Recheck conditions. Weather can change. Conditions can change from a couple of days ago that you maybe call the dive shop. Make sure things are good to go. Really important, Tell someone where you are going, how long you're going to be there, and when to expect you back. Provide them with 
your contact information. If you're a rescue diver, you prepared an emergency action plan during that course. Probably doesn't hurt to put together a brief emergency action plan for any dive site that you're going to. Give it to the individual that is going to sit at home and wait for you to return. On that action plan, it's going to have local uh, numbers for emergency personnel, the dive shop that they can contact if you haven't checked back in after a dive. Phase four, you're at the dive site. Recheck the conditions for yourself. You know you've looked at the weather report on your phone and you walk outside and it's completely different from what it said on your phone. So go evaluate those site conditions. Make sure it's still safe to dive by yourself that day. You will have a dive plan hopefully put together prior to arriving at that dive site that takes into depth, time considerations based on your surface air consumption rate, and we want to always stay within non-decompression limits as recreational divers. And as such, our plan does not include the use of a redundant gas. When we plan a dive, we want to make sure that we're planning it for our primary tank only. Your redundant gas is there for emergency purposes. It should not be part of your dive plan to consume your 80 cubic foot tank and then use your redundant gas. That's not how it works in the solo diving world. All of you remember from your open water class, BWRAF, Burgers with Rings and Fries. Bruce Willis releases awesome films. I'm sorry to you people who are Bruce Willis haters out there. But he does. You know he does. Armageddon, enough said. So, BWRAF, we're always going to do our pre-dive safety check. But because we have extra equipment, we need to make sure that's part of our pre-dive safety check too. So as much as we're going to check the air and breathe of our regulators from our main system, we're going to also check our redundant system, make sure that it's turned on, make sure we have the appropriate pressure that we expect to see, that we can breathe from that system, and all of the other redundant gear, BWRAF. <laughs>
the amount of gas that you have used during that time is obviously the starting amount minus the ending amount to give you the amount of gas that you used. Now comes the mathematical portion. This is for the imperial method. We are going to take the pressure used divided by the full working pressure of that particular tank times its capacity in cubic feet. We're going to divide that number by the depth in feet that you chose to do your level dive at, add 33 feet, and then divide that by 33. This is how we take into account the depth of the dive for the surface air consumption rate. Once we have that number, we're then going to divide it by the top number and then divide it by the time in minutes, i.e. how long did you do that level dive for. Ultimately, the answer you'll have will be in cubic feet per minute. That is the amount of air that we'll use in cubic feet per minute. And for our friends who live in the rest of the world who may use the metric system, that calculation is just a little bit easier. You're going to use the pressure used or bar used times the cylinder volume in liters. You're going to divide that number by your depth in meters plus 10 meters divided by 10 and then divide that whole number by the time in minutes. You will ultimately end up with a calculation of liters per minute. So let's do an example just to make a little bit more sense of this. So we're going to dive for 50 feet for 10 minutes. The starting pressure is 3000 PSI. We use 800 PSI during that 10 minutes and our cylinder is an 80 cubic foot aluminum cylinder. Using that calculation method, our sack rate would be 0.85 cubic feet per minute. This number will allow us to continue to calculate all other numbers when dive planning and measuring gas needed for the dive and for reserve pressures. So that's a nice way for us to calculate surface air consumption rate. Uh, remember, your surface air consumption rate can vary on a given day based on conditions, the environment that you're diving in, how your physiology is working that particular day. But it, this gives you a good general idea of just how much gas you're going to use on a given dive and it allows you to add that to your dive planning calculations. We don't have time and you probably don't have the patience for us to cover every single little calculation that would occur during a self-reliant diver class. But in addition to surface air consumption rates, we're going to have to figure out what is the total amount of gas that I'm going to need, what volume of gas am I going to need based on the depth and the time of where I'm diving. We have to calculate in addition to that, my reserve pressure. There's a variety of ways that people can use calculations for dive planning. One of the most common one is the rule of thirds, meaning I'm going to use up the first third of my tank on the first part of my dive. My second third is going to be used on my return back to the boat or shore, and I leave a third in my tank as my reserve. And as we noted, the reserve is in your main primary tank. Your redundant gas system is not part of the calculation of your reserve gas. And lastly, the things that you're gonna cover is you're gonna work with an instructor and build a list of anticipated emergency scenarios, what could occur and how would you respond to that. A self-reliant diver needs to have a self-reliant mentality to fulfill the primary objective of any dive, which as you know by now, is to return safely from every dive. We have a saying in the scuba world, it says plan your dive and dive your plan. Divers who get into trouble tend to deviate from the plan they made or they didn't plan it in the first place. Well, hopefully we have given your most important piece of diving gear some additional information things that you must know to become a solo diver. I know you love the gear, we love the diving, but our brain really needs to fill in all the details to make it work. Next up, we're finally gonna go diving. We're gonna show you the skills involved in the Self-Reliant Diver course 
what you need to do to prove to us that you could become a solo diver. Are you ready? Are you really ready to become a solo diver? Let's find out. We are gonna to talk today about how do you know you are ready to become a solo diver, a self-reliant diver. You've proven it in the classroom. You've proven it with your gear set up. Now, let's put you in the water and figure out if you can do what is required to become a safe solo diver. We are gonna go visit with my good friend, good friends, Mark Lindsay, course director, owner of Sweet Bottom Dive Center down in St. Croix, and a guy that many of you who watch scuba channels already know, Jeff. Jeff is the uh, creator for Triton's Realm. Him and his wife and, and son do some phenomenal adventure dives. We are going to look first at all of the gear that we've looked at that we have told you is the must have and the essential gear. How do we put all of that together? What is the different gear setups? Di Jeff and I are gonna dive a different bit of a, a, a setup. Uh, one of us is going to have a side slung stage bottle. One of us is going to have a pony tank that is actually attached to our primary tank in behind us. So let's take a look at that setup. On this Lyle, we have a 30 cubic foot aluminum cylinder and it's a standard stage mount kit. And so if you look over here, you'll see that it clips on the top and it clips on the bottom. And this is all part of the kit that goes on the bottle. Now, the other portion that goes along with it is going to be these two retention bands. And so what we do is we just nicely um, put the regulator hose so that it's nice and streamlined and out of the way. And then we can go ahead and uh, the mouthpiece will fit right in there. But on this one, we also have a little swivel snap bolt just to give it a little bit more. Okay. Now, one of the things that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to offset the weight of this bottle. And so we figured that it weighs anywhere from two to three pounds. It depends on what the diver's preference is. So Jeff would then remove two to three pounds of weight from this side, and the bottle would be that additional weight. Okay, so he's balancing himself out in the Correct. water. Correct. Okay. So Lyle, what Lyle has here is he's got a 19 cubic foot aluminum cylinder, and it's mounted attached directly to the band of the main cylinder. And if you see, it just kind of slips in there and then when you tighten up the top band, it holds it nice and firm. Uh, as we showed you in, a future, in the uh, previous video, he's got the nice DIN regulator set up. So um, again, it's nice and streamlined and small, not a lot of things hanging out. He's got a small pressure gauge here on a six inch high pressure hose. And then here he's got his uh, secondary regulator, or this is gonna be his redundant backup regulator. Now, one of the things that we've noticed with this is that uh, when the bottle is mounted on the left side like this, it makes it a little awkward being a right-handed regulator, but the dive right regulator does have the ability to switch from a left-handed to a right-handed regulator. So that's one of the alterations that we're gonna make here, is switch that regulator so it's a little bit more comfortable in the mouth. Right. And the reason that Lyle is wearing it on the left side, as you can see, he's got his standard uh, regulator coming off the right, and he's also got his alternate coming off the right. So really to have another regulator here would be just a little bit too much clutter. And so that's why we decided we wanted to mount it on the left. Now the one other thing that we could look at doing too here is we have a little bit of hose hanging here. We may take and, and even move this up to a clip here to just uh, take up some of the slack in that hose so there isn't an area where he can get entangled or caught up on. Perfect. But a great system of redundancy here. And this is a typical public safety diver setup. Next up. Let's get into Cane Bay, and we are gonna work through some of the skills that you are going to be required to do during your self-reliant course. So we descend over the wall of Cane Bay. Mark is there to adjudicate our instructor skills.
First up is our surface air consumption calculation. A level dive at 50 feet for 10 minutes, calculating our gas pressure every minute along the way. Then it's on to switching to our redundant air source. First, I'm asked to simulate a free-flowing regulator and switch to my redundant source. Jeff is then asked to simulate an out-of-air scenario and switch to his redundant air source. Then he's asked to neatly pack it all back together again. Jeff now provides me with coordinates for navigation. He also provides me with the number of fin kicks he's requiring. You'll carry out several different navigation scenarios, both compass and natural navigation. Swimming without your mask for two full minutes is no easy task. Jeff makes it look really easy here, but it really shows you the reason why we always carry an extra mask as a solo diver. Dive one and two, skills done. Let's chat a little bit about that with the guys. Task loading. Mark, uh, Mark threw some tasks at us today, uh, multiple things at the same time. Yeah, so, you know, self-reliant diver, what we want to do is, first of all, we want to ensure that the diver is a good, solid diver, confident diver. Um, we're teaching you about redundant air systems right. and other redundant systems. We're really getting into more gas management and advanced dive planning. And of course, you're gonna encounter some challenges and we wanna make sure that you're up for those challenges. And both you guys did an excellent job today. And of course, uh, also being able to uh, uh, deploy a surface marker buoy from depth. Right. Um, as we all know, it's, it's a skill that we really don't practice that much. So in this class, we're doing it on every dive. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was really good to practice that again and uh, just do it in different, inflate it in different, uh, do, inflate it in different methods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I learned something new today and uh, how you inflated yours. So. And of course, the most important thing, support your local dive center. I think he said that last time. On your very last dive, as a self-reliant slash solo diver, your instructor is going to put you in the water and expect you to plan and execute that dive all by yourself. Let's see what happens. When Jeff and I reached our descent point, we both said goodbye to each other. It's a little disconcerting watching your buddy swim off into the distance but it's time to be a self-reliant diver and head out on your own adventure. You put together the dive plan, you've put in the hard work, you're trained, you're prepared. It's time to relish in the glory of the underwater world that we all love, this time completely alone as a solo diver.
Jeff and I had both planned a 30 minute dive at 50 feet and it just so happened we both navigated back to the ascent point at the exact same time. Putting up our SMB from neutral buoyancy at 15 feet to get our safety stop in, it was time to surface and celebrate. to tell you the first time that you are sent out all by yourself completely alone at 50 feet hanging over a wall or wherever you might be diving there's a few thoughts that go through your head but you have been adequately prepared your instructor uh, and I as an instructor we certainly wouldn't let someone complete that dive if I didn't feel that they had proven to me during classroom during gear setup and during their first two dives that they didn't have what it took. So that's been a great look at the actual course. We've worked our way through the gear, we've worked our way through the classroom session and the skills involved in the course itself. Next up, I am going to talk to you about Zen and the art of solo diving. Imagine a place you can go to not only lose yourself, but to find yourself. Not just a physical location, but a mental state of being. A place where all you have to be is present. Scuba diving gives that to me. And as a solo diver, it truly is a state of Zen. Come follow me on this trip. Welcome to everything scuba. We've covered a lot of ground over the past few episodes talking all about solo diving, self-reliant diving, and how we get to the point of being a solo diver. Today, we're gonna get a little spiritual on you. Solo diving, for me, and probably for many of you out there, is a way to experience the world in a way that no one else gets to experience it. Anytime my head disappears below the surface of the ocean and I get to witness the world around me and all I can hear is myself breathing, that is as close to a zen-like state as I can imagine. So today I'm gonna to walk you through two solo dives that I did on the same day, had an absolute blast uh, at Frederickstead Pier in St. Croix, spent nearly three hours underwater by myself, and I'm gonna show you some of the really cool things that I got to experience, see, and do. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun, side by side our fears are done, all the good times just begun. Today, we're going to show you what it means to be a solo diver. Uh, so, I'm here by myself, have all the necessary equipment, got my stage bottle. I'm out here in Frederickstad at the pier. Nice, easy dive, probably get 90 plus minutes of bottom time. Uh, but the pier is just phenomenal. There's so many things to see. I could dive this place over and over and over again and never see the same thing twice. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of video, some photos, some of the stuff that uh, we did today. So stick around. As I descended, it was raining really hard, but the squid didn't seem to mind. Every turtle you see on this video is its own unique individual 
I lost count of how many turtles I saw in this dive. squid seemed to accept me as one of their own, so I just went with it. As I headed away from the pier, I noticed something in the sand. A little head. As I approached, he disappeared, and so I settled down to steady my camera, and I waited. Slowly but surely, he began to look out, And I waited and waited. Amazing things are worth waiting for. This angelic yellowhead jawfish danced like no one was watching. This was an amazing end to an amazing day of diving. with squid, turtles, uh, basically 45 minutes just watching a yellow hat jawfish do his thing. Uh, as a solo diver, other people around you would have been losing their minds, but I it was just one of the most coolest days of diving that I've ever had. And so I, I hope that you enjoyed uh, that content. And actually putting this entire series together about solo diving has been just a blast. Uh, I love bringing this content to you guys. I, I hope it's been worthwhile. Uh, I would love to hear any comments down below uh, if there's additional things that I missed out on and didn't cover that you want to know more about. Uh, if there's other content that you think that we could bring to you both from an instructional perspective or just diving in general, uh, we'd love to hear about it.